Hello, my name is Armando and I'm a naturalist here at Beaver Lake Nature Center. In this four-part video series, Nature at Home, we are going to discuss how to create a natural space in and outside of your home. This week we are on the final part, part four, where we are going to talk about indoor gardening. So indoor gardening is basically taking container gardening but putting it inside your home. A lot of people will either do small little plants in a few places, one large statement plant, or even just a few plants that will just add a little bit of extra oomph to their aesthetic or the decoration. Usually there's a lot more interior design and design aspects when you're including plants into your home. Some people though, especially nowadays, have gone as far as being plant collectors. You know, they love house plants, they really love taking care of them, and they love getting really interesting, unique plants with different types of foliage, maybe some different types of flowers if they flower, and really collecting them. This is actually part of my own personal collection. Um, this is actually a corner of my bedroom, believe it or not. And I am one of those people that do collect house plants, and I absolutely love it. Most people believe that house plants clean their air add more oxygen, clean out toxins, but you are going to need hundreds, around like five to 600 different plants in order to actually make a dent in your air quality. Granted, they do release oxygen, don't get me wrong, that is a very true fact, but for it to have a significant change and impact into your actual air quality, you do need a lot more than even this amount of plants. So that's something to note as well. So if you're interested in houseplants, here are some things to consider. Now, if you've watched the previous videos, you know, you're, you know what the first one is going to be, and that is going to be your light. So light is very important even for houseplants. Now, most houseplants that we grow, at least the tropical foliage type of plants, they don't really require as much light as people think. Now, there are some plants that will require full direct sun, Think like a cactus or some succulents. Um, and there's even some big leafy foliage plants um, that will require a lot of light. But most of the plants that we grow that are considered house plants are native to areas that are overgrown jungles, basically. And they usually grow on the forest floor or epiphytically, so they are always underneath some form of shade. So usually low to medium light. There's a, quite a few plants you can grow in low to medium light. Most plants prefer the bright indirect light, basically really bright light, but no direct sun rays on its leaves. A good rule of thumb, if you can read a book in the room that you're in without artificial lighting, that is a good place to put a plant. So that is, you really need to consider your light levels, considering our light for plants only comes in through the windows, and unless you have a skylight, you don't have the light coming from right above. Now, if you don't have that much light, like in the corner of my bedroom that I showed you, that's a north facing window with a building next to it. I don't get a lot of light there. You can supplement and augment the light with grow lights. Now, lights specifically manufactured for grow lights can be very expensive. So if you want a good grow light, you might have to shell out a little bit more money, or you can buy daylight bulbs that, are sort of, that look like daylight, and you have to buy a, a full spectrum bulb, and you can just put that into your lighting fixtures, and that's a cheaper way of doing that. If you're interested in adding in those kinds of light bulbs, let me know, and I will put the specs that you need for the light bulbs to help it, to make it considered a grow light, and I'll put it down below in the comments. Next is your space. So, unlike container gardening outside, where you have you know, a fairly large space you can put plants. Indoors, you're very limited to your wall space and your furniture. So you, we kind of get creative with the space for our plants. And you, luckily, you know, you can do horizontally on tables or on the ground, but you can also do vertically, which is nice. You can attach things to walls, hang things, have bookshelves, all that stuff. So get creative with the space and figure out where you put your, want to put your plants, but just remember it has to be based off of your light as well. So think about your space in the sense of how much light does this area get? What plants can I put there? Next is your water. So 
tropical plants, well, nature plants and of nature in general, they don't water on a schedule. And oftentimes you'll hear people, I water once a week, or I water every other week, or Sunday is my watering day. No. <laughs> my recommendation is every day, just for, for about 10 minutes. So, you know, if you go and in the mornings, you know, maybe you drink coffee or tea in the morning, you brew whatever you have, and take a watering can with you and just check your plants while you drink your coffee or your tea or a glass of water for yourself and see if the plant needs water. There are quite a few telltale signs that tell you if the plant needs water. Either the leaves are a little bit droopy or if they are more succulent leaf, they're a little bit wrinkled or they're not as strong anymore because if you pinch them, they might easily bend. Whereas if they're fully watered, they don't easily bend as much. You know, so take time to get to know your plants and see what their, wa what their water schedule is like because nature does not schedule when it rains and it just waters. Something else to be mindful about is the mineral content of your water as well. You don't want to water too much with tap water just because our tap water is technically, there's chlorine added, fluoride, all that stuff. Most plants don't do well with chlorine and fluoride. They don't have teeth. Um, so something that I recommend is either rain collecting. Onondaga County does have a Save the Rain program, so that is a good way to get your water for your plants. You can also use distilled water, but I don't really recommend that too much because it could get costly, and that's a lot of plastic waste as well because you're purchasing jugs of distilled water, or get a filter. I use a Brita filter for my plants, and they're doing just fine. Some plants, I do just use the plain tap water, and they're doing okay. So some plants are a little bit more sensitive than the others, so that's something to keep an eye out on as well. And in the same vein as watering, let's talk about humidity. So for tropical plants in particular, humidity is incredibly important. They live in a very humid climate. Luckily, in central New York right now in the summer, it is relatively humid outside, so just open your windows and that'll let the humidity in your, in your home. Now, talking about winter, you are going to need something to up the humidity a little bit. Otherwise, your plants will just dry out and they will not do well. So a couple of really easy and cheap ways to do it, buy more plants. <laughs> it sounds counterintuitive, but trust me, if you put the plants together and sort of make them grow like a, their own little mini jungle, that creates a small microclimate where water won't evaporate as fast, increasing the local humidity just a little bit. You can also put the plants on pebble trays where literally it's just a tray full of pebbles and then you put water in there. So the pebbles will keep the plants out of the water directly, which means the roots won't grow into the water and rot. And as the water evaporates, it leaves a little bit more humidity in that local area. Some people will say misting will, will increase humidity, and that is partially true. It does increase the humidity locally, but it won't keep it there. It'll last about 10 minutes, whereas if you have a pebble tray and putting the plants together, it'll the humidity will last a little bit longer. And then you can augment that a little bit by misting and adding a little bit more humidity in there, because then it'll get trapped in that system. But if you're just relying on misting, it won't keep your plants happy in the humidity, if you will. You can go a little bit further than that and purchase a humidifier. Um, I have a very fancy humidifier. I kind of shelled out some decent money on it because it is automatic. It, it, does, it has a, a hot mist and a cool mist, and it automatically turns on when it reaches 60% humidity, and you can change the humidity levels it can turn on to. So it's a very fancy humidifier, and it does cost a pretty penny. And you are going to want to make sure you use at least filtered if not distilled water in the humidifier, otherwise you will get a calcium buildup and just mineral buildup in general, and which means you'll have to clean it a lot more. I usually clean my, my humidifier once a month by adding in also something like vinegar to help with the mineral buildup, and I make sure I let it dry out completely. If you only have a small amount of plants, I suggest using those aroma diffusers. They, they kind of vaporize water with essential oils in them, and help you make a nice smelling scent in your home. If you take the essential oils out, that's basically a humidifier. So if you have a small amount of plants, just group the plants around that humidifier, and you might have to fill it out once a day. But you know what? 
at least you're, you have that local humidity, which will benefit your plants greatly. Next, let's talk about soil. Now, in my previous video, we talked about soil for container gardens, and that is the same exact soil mixture that I would use for all my house plants to a certain degree. Some plants do require more specialized soils like succulents. They don't do soils the, the way the tropical plants do soils. Even carnivorous plants will do differently. So just make sure that you understand where your plants are coming from. So my go-to mixture is equal parts, so a one-to-one -one ratio of potting soil and perlite, and then adding in a half part of orchid bark. If you think about a tropical rainforest, the jungle floor is full of organic materials. There's plants that are dying, there are twigs that are falling, there's rocks, you know, things are just falling to the forest floor constantly, and it's constantly turning into compost, if you will. So there's a really airy mixture in that soil, which is where most of the tropical plants that we grow, grow in. So adding in the extra air and chunkiness lets water go right through, which is similar to a tropical rainforest but it still holds a lot of moisture in there because of all those organic materials. So you wanna try and retain enough moisture that the plants don't completely dry out too, too fast, but they, they're not sitting in water, so you want the water to run right through, a nice, chunky, airy mix. And obviously, depending on the type of plant, it will change, whereas something like a desert cactus will require a sandier soil. So. Broadly speaking, in terms of the tropical houseplant soils, my go-to mixture is one-to-one -one potting soil perlite and a half part of orchid bark. Next, let's talk about your pots and containers. There's a variety of different types of containers you can use, ranging from metal pots, wooden pots, ceramic, terracotta, plastic. There's a lot of containers you can use. My preference is plastic because I'm what I call a cereal underwater and plastic doesn't let water go through the sides. Whereas something like terracotta, which is a lot more porous, water will leach out of the sides, drying out the soil a lot faster. It, something you wanna make sure you have too is a drainage hole. You want the pots to have a drainage hole. Now, if you have a beautiful pot that somebody got you, but it doesn't have a drainage hole and you don't wanna drill a hole into it because you might crack it, you can use it as what we call a cash pot. Basically, you're taking the pot and you're putting it with a drainage hole, the pot with a drainage hole, and you're putting it right inside the pot that doesn't have it and kind of hiding the pot, if you will. And so it's a good way to still have those beautiful pots that you might have that don't have a drainage holes, but still using them. And that cash pot will capture all extra water that runs through the soil, which then you can just dump out at a later time. You can even, if the pot is tall enough, add pebbles on the bottom, so you can also have a pebble tray that way and still be using the pot. Next, pests. Now, outdoors, you will also run into insect pests, but it's a little bit more, I wanna say, invasive if they're inside. The nice thing about outdoors is that natural plant pests also have natural predators, but inside your home, those natural predators won't be able to get inside into your plants. So you will run into pests and it'll be up to you to get rid of them. Now, some people might say, I've never had pests in my entire life. I don't need to worry about it. Lucky you. But there is a good chance that sometime down the line, if you're not careful, you will get a pest. Sometimes that means if you bring a new plant in, but you don't quarantine it properly, it develops pests and it runs rampant into your home. There you go. Or even the soil mix that you buy, if you're not careful, sometimes it might get pests in it as well. So you wanna make sure it's sealed properly, that it's put away in a proper place where it won't run into pests. But sometimes they're already in there and we don't know. So this is just something that we all have to deal with. Plants are nature. These pests are technically nature. It's all part of an ecosystem that we're sort of developing indoors. A lot of people will tell you, you need to spray this spray, you need to um, add this mixture to your soil to get rid of them. And that's all fine and dandy. My only concern with spraying or using mixtures is that depending on who you have in your home, sometimes that stuff is not the greatest for people. And you, wanna, you do wanna make sure that you're using stuff that is generally non-toxic. So people will use food grade diatomaceous earth 
Uh, it kills all the larvae in the soil of any insects. People will use neem oil and spray down their plants. Some people will use a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water to kill off larvae. All that is great, all that is safe, but I think the most surefire way to actually get rid of insects is just picking it off. <laughs> Physical eradication, if you will, it's a little bit more time consuming, but if the infestation is small enough, I just recommend picking those plants and picking off those individual insects. If you have a massive infestation, then I would say go ahead and start using some form of systemic, but you're going to want to be careful with those plants in particular. Make sure that if you have a little one at home, be it a child or an animal, that they don't get into that pot because it could be toxic to them. If you have enough plants, usually I tell people if you have hundreds of plants, then I would recommend releasing beneficial insects into your home, like ladybugs or lacewing flies. They will go after the insects, and then once you kind of notice the infestation is gone, you can just open the windows and they will leave. To, the best way to make them leave is turn off all the lights and just open the window. They'll be attracted to the light and they will leave that way. So that's another way of doing it, but like I said, beneficial, beneficial insects, only if you have a substantial amount of plants. Otherwise, you're gonna be overrun with insects, even if it is the good kind. So now, we talked a little bit about how to set things up and what to look for, what to consider. Let's talk a few different houseplants. These are five different houseplants that I personally grow and that I believe are really easy plants to grow that aren't the stereotypical plants that most people usually get. First is this. So just as a note, most houseplant growers know their plants usually by scientific name and not really by a common name. There are common names, but the only issue with the houseplant community is that we have people all around the world that grow plants, and the best way for them to be able to talk about plants is to use a scientific name because everyone has a different common name for plants. So this particular plant, the common name is satin pothos, but it is a Scandapsis pictus. It is a vining plant that if you let it climb, as it matures, it'll shingle, so it'll kind of line up next to each other like shingles on a roof. And it is a tropical plant with a really nice textured leaf and really nice, beautiful color that's a little bit of iridescent in the light. These guys can grow in low light areas. They won't really put off a lot of new growth, but they will survive and they won't really change much. In that sense, they also don't need as much water if you're putting it in those kinds of conditions. These will, do, these will grow better in bright indirect light, which also means that you will need to up your watering too if you have that in a brighter light area. A good way to see if these plants need light is if the lead starts to curl in, think like a burrito, if they curl in like that, that's a good time for them to water. But these will last a long time without needing any water. Next, let's talk about Raphidophora tetrasperma, also called mini monstera. If you're familiar with Monstera deliciosa, it, is a, it was a very popular plant in the 60s, and it's actually a hugely popular plant now, especially its many horticultural varieties. This is a small version of that, if you will. They're not in the same genus, but they look pretty similar with these split leaves and the fenestrations if these get a little bit older. Now, these are a very aggressive grower and they will climb. They'll find a place to climb. They will not vine. As soon as they latch onto something, they will start making their way up. So I would highly suggest giving this some form of plank, trellis, something to climb on. Otherwise, it'll start climbing on your walls and it could damage your walls. Just be aware of that. But. They're incredibly fast growing. I got mine, it was like four or five leaves. This is actually a picture of mine. It was like four or five leaves and now it's doubled in, well, now currently with this video and when I took this picture, it's doubled in this size. So since I've gotten it in January, it's about quadrupled in size. So it's a very, very fast growing plant. So it's very rewarding in the sense that once you figure out how it's growing, it's going to reward you pretty fast. So I definitely recommend getting a Raphidophora tetrasperma. They're incredible plants, incredibly fast growing. They do okay in low light, but they will, if you want them to grow bigger leaves, put them in a brighter light and water accordingly. You will see that they will start to flop a little bit 
if they're not as because they when they grow out they'll, they'll grow out pretty parallel to each other and if you see them kind of start to flop a little bit that's a good time to water them Next, one of my favorites, aglianemas. They are also called Chinese evergreens, but they're, they come in a very wide variety of colors. They can come from greens, yellows, pinks. There's a lot of different types of aglianemas. This one in particular is an aglianema silver bay. It's one of my favorite plants. It's got a beautiful silvery color to the leaf, and it's, they have very long lance-shaped leaves, and they're really, really beautiful to look at. Aglianemas in general, do best in medium light. If you give them too bright of a light, they're, they're not gonna respond to it as well. So put them in about a medium light. They can do okay in low light. They can do actually pretty well in low light, and which means they don't need as much water as well. Same thing with the Raphidophora tetrasperma. They, 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 they generally, maybe like this, when their leaves are nice and watered, and as time goes on, if they need more water, they'll droop. So be aware of that. And, and keep an eye on these plants when they do that. That means they need a good watering. But other than that, they're very low minimal plants, don't need a lot of care. Next, I think it's the number one house plant when people say, I have really low light, um, I tend to forget to water plants, uh, I don't do a lot of plant care. Zamiococcus zamifolia, the ZZ plant. They are an incredibly slow growing plant. So if you are an impatient plant grower, these won't grow that fast. However, they will survive almost anything. They're incredibly succulent. Their stems are very thick and their rhizomes are also very thick and their roots as well, which means they hold onto a lot of water. So you don't need to water them that frequently. I think I left mine for like three months and it was fine. It didn't show any signs of decay or dying or wilting. It was just standing real tall. And then eventually I started seeing new growth. So I started watering a little bit more, um, just giving it just maybe more water every two weeks. And then it shot up a new frond completely. And it's huge now. <laughs> so keep an eye on them. They're, they're not gonna need a lot of water. They're not, they don't even need a lot of light. There was someone who, I don't remember who it was, but they did an experiment where they put a ZZ plant in a cupboard for six months and kept it closed. They opened it up and it looked exactly the same as the day they put it in. So these guys can actually withstand a lot. So they're a very good, easy beginner plant. Now for those of us who might love our plants a little bit too much, basically meaning maybe you add a little too much water all the time, this is a good plant to consider. This is a Maranta leuconura also called a prayer plant. Now prayer plants, there's a lot of different types of prayer plants, but usually when people think prayer plants, they think of this one. Uh, this is a Maranta leuconura or the red prayer plant. These have grown so well for me. It's even in when I didn't have a humidifier, they still, it's like doubled in size. I cut it and propagated and it grew back right away in almost a month. It's as long, if not longer than it was. And these will drape eventually. And they do move throughout the day. So that is something you can also look forward to. These require a little bit more watering than your other plants. And they will tell you when they need more water because the leaves will also curl. And they don't do that well in bright light. So medium light is good. If you look underneath, they have the, those red undersides. Usually the red means they are going to reflect light back up the leaf, so they're using as much light as possible. So these don't need that much light, but they will need a little bit more moisture. So you might need to either up the humidity a little bit, give it more humidity in terms of either putting directly on a pebble tray or next to a humidifier, and making sure that the water is a good even moisture. Generally, when you take your finger, you stick it in the soil. If the soil is dry up to your first knuckle, for these ones, go ahead and give them water. Some plants can withstand much longer without water, but these guys will need a little bit more water than the previous plants that we talked about. So that is it for the four part video series, Nature at Home. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey of planting a beautiful garden in and outside of your home. I hope that you are able to create the natural space that you've been looking for. And if you have any further questions, 
please feel free to leave a comment down below and we will get back to you as soon as we can. And please talk more house plants with me. I love talking about plants. So feel free to reach out with any questions you have. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a good day.